Despite what the early marketing of mixed martial arts would indicate, there are plenty of rules and they've only expanded with time. And while the unified rules of mixed martial arts aren't exactly unified anymore, today what I want to talk about are the rules that you will not find in any commission document. The rules that are largely adhered to by fighters, but that are completely unspoken. These unsanctioned regulations are silently understood in the community as barriers you do not cross, practices to be avoided, and truths about the sport that are universal yet unofficial. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are 10 unwritten rules of mixed martial arts. Number 10. You have to beat the champ. It's the absolute dumbest unwritten rule in my opinion, which is why it sits at number 10. To me, it makes absolutely no sense, but there are plenty of fighters and fans who disagree with me. There's a large group of people in the community that feel you must beat the champion in order to win the title, meaning you must finish them or beat them definitively on the cards. There are no close decisions that should go to the challenger because of this unwritten rule, apparently. Forget the fact that it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever that because someone comes into a bout as the champion, that that should somehow be considered as part of the scoring criteria. It's just the way it goes. Ric Flair always said it, so it must be true. But to be the man, you gotta beat the man. Now, just because I disagree with it doesn't mean I don't recognize the fact that it is one of these unwritten rules that many believe to be true. I fully acknowledge that those fighters and fans who feel that way exist. I just don't understand in any way why that should be a rule. You either won the fight based on the criteria we use to determine winners and losers, or you didn't. There are a ton of close fights that are decided by decisions. What makes it even sillier is is that each round is scored individually after the round, so it's not even a collective anyway. If the challenger won the first three rounds but got beat up for the last two, the whole of the fight isn't looked at afterwards where a judge could then say, well, this guy's the champ, so those two rounds count for more. It doesn't even work like that. It's a silly unwritten rule, but one you'll hear about after any close title fight. Number nine, no excuses. This is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek unwritten rule because it feels as if every fighter very much believes in it, but rarely follows it truly. The rule is you don't make excuses excuses about your fights. That is, of course, unless you preface those excuses with the phrase, I'm not making any excuses, but then it's perfectly acceptable to rattle off a whole host of reasons why you didn't perform well. We've seen this time and time again. There's all sorts of classics. Camp didn't go well. I had a bad weight cut. I came in flat tonight. I was as sick as a dog all fight week. First thing I did this morning was sneezed three times. And of course, the undisclosed injuries. My foot was a balloon. My foot was a balloon. Which are perhaps the most taboo to bring up after a defeat. If you win, you're more than welcome to let everybody know what a hero you are by explaining that you came into the fight with a broken arm or six herniated discs. But if you lose, we don't want to hear a damn thing about the ruptured spleen you got in camp, apparently, because that sounds like an excuse and those cannot be tolerated. Honestly, this unwritten rule kind of applies to everybody in the entire world, not just fighters, because nobody wants to sound like they're making excuses for why they lost or something didn't go their way. And that's because so many people just see that kind of thing as sour grapes, which is funny because everybody both does it and despises it. We don't want to sound like we're making excuses, but we have this innate desire to explain things, to tell people why it is we failed, which is why so many fighters preface their excuses by claiming not to make them. An unwritten rule rarely followed. Number eight, everybody gets at least one free foul. This is one of those unwritten rules that many have speculated would be something a fighter could actively exploit for a major advantage, and perhaps they have. But if that is the case, then they certainly aren't open discussing it. This rule is based on observational fact. Everybody gets at least one free foul in most cases. A referee will rarely take a point the first time you kick an opponent in the junk, poke an eye, grab the fence, grip the inside of your opponent's glove, pull their shorts. You name it, with rare exceptions, the first time you're caught doing the majority of these fouls, the referee may not even stop the action. But if they do, they're going to give you a warning. A stern warning, perhaps, but a warning with no real consequences. Sometimes several fouls go unpunished. Jermaine Durandamy versus Holly Holm is a fantastic example, and those were late punches after the round that hurt Holm. What's to stop a fighter from accidentally poking an eye at the start of the fight or kicking their opponent in the balls? It's very easy to make that look like it wasn't intentional, but it could have long-lasting effects on the fight itself. This unwritten rule's basis is that most fouls are either not of enough consequence to warrant a point deduction, or that the acts weren't being done in bad faith. It's all at the referee's discretion. Whether that's right or not is hotly debated, but nobody can deny that it's how things operate at the moment in the sport. Number seven, if you were losing, you don't take the DQ. I'm so sorry, Aljo, but we're gonna have to talk about that fight because it's the most prominent example ever. This is certainly a rule that does not pop up every single fight card. It's a pretty rare occasion, in fact, but that doesn't mean that it's not very clear how fighters feel about it largely. If it's late in a fight and you were losing that fight substantially but suffer a major foul that could result in a DQ victory if you are unable to continue, you do everything in your power to keep that fight going and God help you 
If you so much as even remotely look like you're milking it in any capacity, let alone accept the win. While Sterling versus Jan is of course the most famous and best example, on the opposite end of this, you have John Jones versus Anthony Smith at UFC 235. Jones landed an illegal knee to the head in the fourth round, and it was a bad one. Smith was certainly not in a good way, but knowing that it would end the fight and lead to victory and a title change, Anthony, who was very much beat up at that point and was on his way to losing a unanimous decision, got up and kept going, refusing to allow the fight to end. And his decision to do so was mostly met with praise by other fighters, fans, and media. It was seen as, quote, the right decision on his part, even though he was perfectly within the written rules to take a DQ victory. Which brings us to Aljo. Fans felt he was acting after the knee, that he didn't show the proper amount of discouragement over the incident leading to the title change, and then of course he has milked the villain role over it since then. While a rare occasion, these two fights are perfect examples of this unwritten rule in action. Number six, don't pull out of a fight for minor injuries. Do you have a scheduled bout coming up, but you've suffered some sort of injury during camp? Unless your leg has fallen off, you better drag your ass to the cage because this unwritten rule is clear. Nobody pulls out of fights for quote, minor injuries. Now, of course, there's a sliding scale of what constitutes minor in the eyes of many a fighter. Conor McGregor is notorious for making light of the reasons his opponents have pulled out of bouts. Jose Aldo's broken rib, RDA's broken foot, nonsense, merely flesh wounds. Conor, he'll fight even when his foot is a balloon. And while not all fighters will be as willing as McGregor to downplay the severity of the injuries of an opponent who has opted out of a bout, we've certainly seen time and time again fighters unwilling to discuss too much about the matter, largely because of the unwritten rule about excuses, but that explain in varying levels of detail that they did injure themselves in camp, but decided to make the walk anyway because they signed a contract and that's just what you do. This type of machismo has backfired many a time, but perhaps no more spectacularly than when Dan Henderson tore his MCL a whole month prior to UFC 151, but figured he'd be all right by fight day, only to explain to the UFC at the last second it didn't look like he'd be able to go, resulting in the pay-per-view's cancellation that John Jones then got blamed for because this sport is weird. In MMA, you fight hurt. It's that simple, and if you pull out of a fight, it better be life-threatening or you're gonna catch the wrath of your opponent as well as many fans. Number five, you don't fight your teammates. It's a very simple unwritten rule and one that many fighters will go to great lengths to adhere to. If you train together, you don't fight each other. You don't get in each other's way. You do whatever it takes to avoid hurting the career of your teammate because sure, it's an individual sport, but iron sharpens iron and such. We're all in this together, the gym is a family, all those good things. Daniel Cormier left the heavyweight division in large part because his best friend and training partner Cain Velasquez was champion. He wasn't about to sacrifice that relationship for his own personal gain, and so he moved to light heavyweight until Cain was gone from the division essentially. But that doesn't mean things always work out that way. Some of the greatest conflicts the sport has ever seen were born of teammates breaking this unwritten rule. Sometimes it was the result of ambition, other times two fighters simply ended up on a collision course. There was just absolutely no way for both of them to be at the top at the same time, and so the quest for gold led to fights between teammates. Or former teammates, these things tend to split gyms up. John Jones and Rashad Evans, Colby Covington and Jorge Masvidal, both good examples. You don't fight your teammate in MMA. That is, until it's time to get that precious gold, then it's every man for himself, which is perhaps as concrete a reality as the rule itself. Number four, what happens at the gym stays there. I saw an interview once with Chris Nolan where he talked about why he never releases outtakes from his movies. He wants his actors to feel like they can just go all out in every scene without fear of some goofy take ending up on a compilation online to make fun of them, essentially creating a space for his actors to feel safe about screwing up. And it was in the moment that I saw that interview that I understood why fighters get so pissed off when former, or I suppose even current teammates, talk about things that happened at the gym. Usually these stories are told to media and are about sparring sessions, the thing that's closest to an actual fight. And it's usually said by someone who used to train with a fighter who is now going to face them in an upcoming bout. The implication being, well, I beat them up in sparring, therefore I will beat them up when we fight on Saturday night. One of the most egregious examples of breaking this rule came from Patrick Cummins, who told stories of making Daniel Cormier cry when they trained together and paid dearly for it. But there's a ton more examples. Fighters threatening to release sparring footage when somebody got KO'd is another big one. There's truth to it. Just like I don't have a knock, I meant like a knock him out and don't have a video don't. of it. It's already, I don't. Been, it's already been, yeah. Release I do that have shit it, but I'm not, yeah. You know that. This unwritten rule is certainly broken, but there's few faster ways to piss off your opponent or lose the respect of other fighters in the sport than discussing things that went on at the gym. It's just seen as a cheap shot, a breaking of a sacred bond. These are places where fighters are learning and trying to get better, and they expect that to be somewhere that they can make mistakes without ridicule from fans. But when some fighters are willing to cross that line, it's not always the case. Number three, you don't talk trash about family. As Will Smith once said to a stunned Chris Rock, 
Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth! Oh, I can, oh, okay. And while it's pretty reasonable to assume that at the Academy Awards while serving in the capacity of a comedian telling G.I. Jane jokes you're not going to catch hands, the same cannot be said about an MMA fight in which you most certainly are going to catch at least one or two, which is perhaps why some fighters are willing to break this unwritten rule of MMA about trash talking that goes beyond the fight and targets family or really anything unrelated to the fight, like religion, insert sensitive topic here. Some pretty prominent examples of fighters crossing those lines are of course Conor McGregor and Colby Covington, but let us not forget that Chael Sonnen is pretty much the godfather of stepping over the line with Anderson Silva's wife and some medium rare steak. I, I never said it. In all instances where family is brought up during trash talk in the build to a fight, there's a large vocal outcry and condemnation by fighters, fans, and media alike. Which is not to say that some aren't okay with it, especially nowadays. You're dead in that octagon tomorrow night! It seems we've crossed some threshold where there's simply nothing that can be said that warrants any kind of negative reaction. I know you gave Glenn a heart attack for all those years you were, you were ducking me, so don't worry, he'll be watching from hell on December 14th. Including up to killing someone's family in their sleep, but that's only for some. The disrespectful nature of moving from discussing why your opponent sucks to bringing up their wife and kids or any other family figure who has nothing to do with the fight is still not gonna fly with a lot of people. And the cheap heat has led to, well, missing teeth and post-fight brawls. Break this unwritten rule at your own peril. Number two, missing weight is inexcusable. There are very few things in MMA that are universally agreed upon, but missing weight being one of the worst things you can do as a fighter is certainly up there. It makes sense too. The other fighter has to make weight, they often do, it's rare that both parties miss, and they had to likely go through a very uncomfortable experience in order to make that weight. So when their opponent hops on the scale five pounds over, it immediately draws anger. They didn't suffer like I had to suffer. They now potentially have a weight advantage over me. If it's a title fight, it's no longer valid. There's just so many reasons it angers fighters. I've yet to see any athlete or media member really defend the practice of missing weight in any substantial way. Sure, fighters will defend themselves for missing weight and give whatever reason they find suitable. Sometimes very legitimate issues do arise, but there is rarely any sympathy from their opponents or the fans. By many accounts, the weight cut is the hardest part of the job, so when a fighter skips out on that in some way, you can bet that the rest of the roster who has been there and done that many times find irritation in their unprofessionalism. In an era where a lot of the unwritten rules of the past are not exactly adhered to anymore by a good chunk of fighters willing to cross those lines, there's still a massive amount of shame in missing weight, and that's not likely to change no matter how many other thresholds are crossed. Number one, no fake glove touches. It's a near universal line that only the most damned of MMA souls dare to cross. It's like uttering the killing curse in Harry Potter. Once done, there's no getting back that piece of your soul that's gone. I'm talking about, of course, the fight opening glove touch. Now you are more than welcome to reject it. We've seen that plenty of times. We've seen plenty of times two fighters who absolutely hate each other not even bother with it whatsoever. Hell, Fabricio Berdum decided to start his fight with Travis Brown by sprinting directly at him and throwing a flying kick to the face. All of those things are perfectly acceptable, and the MMA community wouldn't bat an eye at them. What you cannot do under any circumstance is go for the glove touch yourself or appear to be reciprocating that gesture of respect and then use that moment of vulnerability to throw a strike against an opponent who wasn't expecting it and in some cases doesn't recover after it lands. Now sure, you can say like Floyd Mayweather that the fighter needs to protect themselves at all times, like he did after his fight with Victor Ortiz that ended with a massive shot following a post-foul hug. But you're probably not going to get too many fighters on your side, and Larry Merchant might threaten you. I wish I was 50 years younger and I'd kick your ass. It's unwritten and strictly followed because ultimately, it's just cheap. It's a cheap way to win. You didn't beat somebody, you tricked them. Yes, fighters need to be constantly aware, but that moment, that reaching out of hands, it's a mutual gesture of respect, of putting the fight on hold for just that moment, and it's understood as such. You don't get attacked in the corner during a fight. As far as I'm concerned, that's essentially the same thing, and it's why this unwritten rule is one very few dare to ever disobey. Big ol' shout out to my dude Luke Taylor for editing this video together. You can find him and his awesome digital art on Twitter at cool to me underscore. A big, big thank you to Ben Rosette, who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page at Ben Rosette. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.